in preparing volunteers for psychedelic sessions, as you've heard from Brian and Mary and others, we emphasize the decision to trust one's own mind as unconditionally as possible, the intent to be open and receptive, and the courage to approach and confront content that initially may appear frightening. We rarely suggest specific content, such as regressing to a particular age or explore, exploring a particular area of personal conflict. That is because we have learned that there is a remarkable wisdom in the minds of most, if not all, persons. Usually the content of a session proves to be much more skillful and artistically choreographed than any agenda we could have planned in advance. This supports the belief that there indeed are wise, healing, intentional forces within human consciousness beyond the limits of the everyday personality. It is common after a session for a volunteer to say, you know, I didn't experience what I wanted but I experienced what I needed. We hear that a lot. The philosophical term entelechy well reflects this process of a meaningful unfolding of content, which of course appears to work best when the volunteer feels grounded in a respectful and secure relationship with a therapist or guide. On the day prior to a psychedelic session, when I am finishing up the preparatory work with a volunteer, I often imagine that the person's own creative unconscious has composed a three-act opera and can't wait for it to be experienced. And when the lights dim and the curtain rises on the following day, the volunteer not only will observe the drama, but will discover himself or herself in stage center as his or her unique drama unfolds. In the history of research with psychedelics, the term psycholytic sometimes has been employed to focus on personal psychodynamic forms of, of experience in contrast to the term psychedelic that may include more transcendental forms of experience. More probable with relatively low dosage, psycholytic experiences may entail abreaction, catharsis, and meaningful suffering that often leads to positive feelings of resolution, forgiveness, and rebirth. Most would not consider such experiences spiritual or as having religious import unless it is in the context of a belief that the resolution of psychodynamic conflicts for many is an important phase in the journey of spiritual development. But the actual content does not include awareness of the sacred, visions of deities, or mystical insights. Conversely, as is more probable with higher dosage in a supportive setting, profound visionary, archetypal, and mystical forms of experiences may occur that at least initially appear to have little connection with the everyday historical life of the ego, who may behold the vision or become encompassed within it. When this form of experience occurs, the therapeutic impact appears to derive from the death and rebirth of the ego quite without regard for details of childhood development and current interpersonal struggles at home and work. Some persons who experience a series of psychotherapy sessions facilitated by psychedelics gradually work through content of a personal psychodynamic nature and then finally break through into transcendental forms of awareness. PTSD the universal phenomenon of terror and paralysis in which the nervous system has been strained to the breaking point, leaving body, psyche and soul shattered, is now fully sanitized as a medical disorder. 
with its own convenient acronym and serving the dispassionate nature of science, the archetypal response to carnage has now been artificially severed from its ravaging origins. Where it was once aptly conveyed by the terms fright, paralysis and shell shock, it is now simply a disorder an objectified collection of concrete and measurable symptoms, a diagnosis amenable to vested research protocols, detached insurance companies and behavioral treatment strategies. While this nomenclature provides objective scientific legitimacy to the soldier's very real suffering, it also safely separates doctor from patient. The healthy protected doctor treats the ill patient. This approach disempowers and marginalizes the sufferer, adding to his or her sense of alienation and despair. Less noticed is the likely burnout in the unprotected healer, who has been artificially hoisted onto a precarious pedestal as false prophet. Recently, a young Iraq veteran took issue with calling his combat anguish PTSD and instead poignantly referred to his pain and suffering as PTSI the eye designating injury. What he wisely discerned is that trauma is an injury, not a disorder. In contrast, post-traumatic stress injury is an emotional wound, amenable to healing attention and transformation. Nonetheless, the medical model persists. It arguably functions fairly effectively with diseases, where the doctor holds all of the knowledge and dictates the necessary interventions for a sick patient. This is not, however, a useful paradigm for trauma healing. Rather than being a disease in the classical sense, Trauma is instead a profound experience of this ease or this order. Mild experiences of changes in sensory perception, perhaps accompanied by intriguing, though generally meaningless, mental imagery, may well prove neutral. The potential therapeutic significance of psychodynamic phenomena in content in the context of the so-called Jungian personal unconscious, including themes such as grief and attachment, guilt and forgiveness, anger, love. All this is theoretically congruent with many well-established systems of psychotherapy. The therapeutic potency of transcendental states of consciousness may prove harder for some to comprehend as it goes beyond the didactic content of most mental health education programs. By transcendental, I mean both alternative states characterized by archetypal visions of gods and goddesses, of sacred architecture and art, often resplendent with gemstones and sacred metals, of vast inner panoramas and landscapes, and also of mystical consciousness. For research purposes, as you've heard in more than one lecture, I think, uh, we define mystical consciousness as a state of awareness that includes these six categories of unity, transcendence of time and space, intuitive knowledge, sacredness, deeply felt positive mood, and ineffability and paradoxicality. And these transcendental states are similar, if not identical, with states of consciousness described 
in the world's great religions, such as Samadhi, Nirvana, Sakamufla, the Beatific Vision, Fana, or Wu Wei. Mystics of the world seem to get along really well together, regardless of what tradition they come from. Now, it is difficult to speak or write about these profound transcendental states, as when they occur, there often is no observing ego, and the content is felt to surpass the limits of language and the structures of cognition. I've always been fond of this verse from the Tao Te Ching, those who know do not speak, those who speak do not know. Makes it hard to give a lecture. <laughs> Nonetheless, these profound experiences usually do remain in memory, and the reborn ego is able to recall them as sacred touchstones that radiate spiritual knowledge and a feeling of ultimate security. Among the intuitive insights that remain for many persons, are a conviction of the reality of an eternal structure or principle greater than our individual egos, for which people have many names. Uh, the most popular has been God. Some prefer the ground of being or the nothingness that contains all reality. Or uh, I've always liked Edmund Sinnott at the biologist at Yale, who like to talk about the purposive properties of protoplasm. <laughs> but you can choose your term, but there is something incredibly magnificent greater than our everyday egos. So that's one. Two, in these states, there's a sense of the indestructibility of consciousness that many would call immortality or infinity. Three, an interrelatedness within the great unity called the Brotherhood of Man or the Net of Indra. Four, an appreciation of love as an ontological power and energy beyond the limits of human emotion. And five, a sense of awe at the intrinsic magnificence, the beauty of what has been experienced, both the imagery and the unfolding themes of the, uh, the content. Now, the presence of a memory of this magnitude appears to constitute a powerful therapeutic resource. For the cancer patient approaching death, the memory provides a feeling that ultimately, somehow, all is well. Which makes it possible to live the time that remains more fully, with less anxiety, depression, isolation, pain. For the alcoholic, the narcotic, or nicotine addict, or for any person struggling with depression or anxiety, the memory may testify to inner resources waiting to be more fully tapped, enhanced self-worth, and an awareness of interpersonal connectedness that can decrease feelings of alienation and estrangement. In summary, there is knowledge to be had in archetypal and mystical states of consciousness. The term getting high is simply irrelevant here, unless one wants to understand it in the context of glory to God in the highest. What is called for here is a cooperative and restorative process with the doctor as an assisting guide and midwife. A doctor who insists on retaining his or her protected role as healthy healer remains separate, defending him or herself against 
the ultimate helplessness that lurks phantom like in all of our lives cut off from his or her own feelings such a doctor will not be able to join with the sufferer missing will be the crucial collaboration in containing processing and integrating the patient's horrible sensations images and emotions the sufferer will remain starkly alone holding the very horrors that have overwhelmed him and broken down his capacity to self-regulate and grow in a common therapy resulting from this isolating orientation the therapist instructs the PTSD victim to assert control over his feelings, to manage his aberrant behaviors, and to alter his dysfunctional thoughts. Contrast this alignment to that of shamanic traditions, where the healer and the sufferer join together to re experience terror while calling on cosmic forces to release the grip of the demons that shaman is always first initiated via a profound encounter with his own helplessness and feeling of being shattered prior to assuming the mantle of healer such preparation might suggest a model whereby contemporary therapists must first recognize and engage with their own traumas and emotional wounds from in an unspoken voice how the body releases trauma and restores goodness by peter a levine so how do you see psychedelics being used for trauma Well, that depends on one's understanding of trauma, and 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 trauma really is the um, impacts of, of of painful experiences that we haven't had the opportunity to work through. So they they show up in our lives, and very often they show up uh, unconsciously. That the dynamics <clears throat> that drive human behavior are very often trauma based, but they're not very mm, conscious. So why I might get upset in my marriage for this side or the other often has nothing to do with what I think I'm upset about. It really has to do with some traumatic wound, some deeper dynamic. Now what psychedelics do is they, and you know, of course they all do it differently, but what they can do is remove the, the veil of belief and automatic reactivity that covers our traumatic imprints. So that under the psychedelic experience influence and in the presence of connection, people can actually experience the, the pain that's underneath all that. And they can experience it, they can grieve it, and they can do so with safety and with compassion for themselves. In other words, they can work it through. So that's one aspect of the psychedelic healing experience people you know trauma is is an experience that overwhelms your physiology that overwhelms your nervous system's ability to to regulate and then um, the definition of trauma really has expanded so commission which are the things that are done to us but also acts of omission so when we have a neglectful caregiver or an absent parent that's also um, traumatic that that if we look at trauma simply through the lens of is it overwhelming my ability to regulate is it overwhelming my physiology and then that creates um, limiting beliefs and distressing behaviors then we all experience some sort of trauma throughout our lifetime um you know the um now now i can't remember i'm losing the name drama of the gifted child oh, yeah. um you know all kinds of of what I now see as, as influences in steering me toward 
a, a professional life focused on how do we help the people who traditionally have been most misunderstood, most stigmatized, most severely compromised. And then I heard Judith Herman speak in 1989 and, and it just changed my world because, because I realized, oh, all these people that I have had this affinity for are really trauma survivors. And if we understand them in that light, you know, another influence for me was my first traumatized client mm -hmm. who was an untreatable patient in the hospital system where I was training. And you know how you're so young and idealistic when you're in training. <laughs> so I remember nobody on the staff would work with her as an outpatient. And so I raised my hand and I said, well, I'd like to work with her. And they all probably thought I was nuts. She had her hospital record file was about three feet high. You had to go down to the very bottom file to read her trauma history because after a hundred admissions, nobody bothered to take a history anymore. And she taught me a lot. So many teachers and, uh, and, uh, and all wonderful in different ways. What about Bessel? You, know, you were there in the rows of your early days when he was working and talking about trauma. What were some of the, the early learnings working with him? Well, <laughs> for the most important early learning was that everybody thought I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to, to uh, his trauma center as a supervisor in 1999 and all my colleagues came up to me and said you know just have to tell you as a friend you shouldn't be working with that man he's nuts he has this idea about the body being implicated in post-traumatic stress you know he's nuts just stay stay away <laughs> and then of course he was able to to do research that proved that his cra crazy theory was correct. And, and every week at our clinical team meetings, it was like the whole field changed because each week we were learning more about the neurobiology of trauma. And it was very, it was a very exciting time. Then you made it, when was your transition to work with Pat Ogden? So tell us a little bit about that and how you met Pat and sensory motor, which really well, changed the therapy world. Right. I mean, that was really Bessel too, because, because he, you know, he had this fixation on the body. So every week at our clinical team meetings, somebody would present, usually a series of therapists would present cases and all heads would swivel toward the great man. Oh, what's he going to say? <laughs> and he would say, go to the body. And we'd all go, wow, that's profound. <laughs> but of course, nobody actually knew what to do if they went to the body, <laughs> including Bessel. I mean, <laughs> it was brilliant, but none of us had a clue how to actually do that. And, um, and I actually, I have a former client who was at that time, she was a, uh, a patient at the trauma center. And she said, you know, I remember that one night I called the emergency service and Bessel van der Kolk himself returned my call. And he told me to just sit and watch my fish tank, just watch <laughs> the fish <laughs> swimming back and forth. That, that was the body going to the body as we do it then. But luckily, Bessel met Pat Ogden. And, and, and he pretty quickly saw that she understood how to go to the body. And it was through Bessel that I met her when we were both presenting at Bessel's trauma conference. 
And again, with great reluctance, I signed up for her training because I was so inspired by her work. Uh, you know, you get to a point in your career where you don't want to take another training. You kind of feel like I'm done. I, you know, I, I'm good at what I do. I'm busy. I don't need another training. But I took it and it was, uh, and it transformed my work and my life. And you decided to, and then Pat decided to work with you and move things forward and write the book together? Yes, and then Pat saw that, that there was an opportunity for a collaboration between someone like me who was from the traditional mental health world and understood talking therapy and Pat who was from the body psychotherapy world and had a body oriented psychotherapy. So, um, so we became collaborators and, and I've been a trainer for the sensory motor Institute for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. I, it works best when you relax your body. So, so in with supervision, I, I would try to help therapists um, calm the body and, and just to acknowledge this is a hard, scary time. And, uh, and, and then to use, you know, in sensory motor and other somatically based therapists, we talk about using your own body to calm the client's body, meaning, um, meaning that I can slow my breathing as my client is more and more desperate. I can just slow my breathing. I can slow the pace and tone of my response so that the client say, eh, 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 and I'm saying, yeah, yeah lots of ands yeah so many things to worry about right now so i'm now i have words in there yeah but i'm what i'm doing is i'm using my body to create more calm in the room but here's the wonderful thing at the same time i'm calming my body mm-hmm. so, so it's mutually advantageous i was feeling that <laughs> You I know, feel much calmer now after you gave that. <laughs> yeah, it's a win-win situation. Yeah. Part of my work has been to take Steve Borges's beautiful, elegant um, polyvagal theory, the theory that he developed, and translate it so that it's um, easy to use for um, clinicians um, to bring it into the language that we can use in our uh, therapy practices. So. In our world, the nervous system, we see our clients come to us with dysregulated nervous systems, right? If we were going to look at diagnosis through the lens of polyvagal theory, we would see nervous systems that are dysregulated in a variety of different ways. Um, And as we do look through the lens of the nervous system, um, we help our clients understand that their biology is responding in this way because there's an abundance of cues of danger in their world. And so your, their nervous system is enacting a survival response. And it makes perfect sense when you look at it through the lens of the nervous system um, to help clients understand that if they're not choosing this, their nervous system is choosing it for them, that it doesn't mean anything about their motivation it's, there's no moral meaning attached to this. We humans, the brain makes motivation and moral meaning. The nervous system simply acts. And so when we begin to help our clients understand this, it's a very um, depathologizing um, a way of being, and it helps people let go of the shame and blame that keep them stuck in their patterns of thinking and behaving. And then once that happens, once there's a bit of relaxation coming into to those patterns, curiosity emerges, right? And curiosity is what we're looking for as therapists. When you have a client who who you have that moment when they go, hmm, you can feel that bit of curiosity coming, you know that their system is now open and ready to engage with you. 
So, you know, in polyvagal theory, we, we have a way to map that and track that and shape the system so that there is more of that um, regulation and curiosity available for our clients. Um, the nervous system is really the heart of our daily experience. You know, most of us are trained to work top down from the brain, from the story. And what I want to tell you is the story um, comes from your embodied state, right? The, the information travels the pathways from your body to your brain. 80% of the information traveling this, this parasympathetic, this autonomic pathway is coming from the body to the brain. And then the brain takes that information and makes a story to make sense of what's happening in the body. So even though we like to think that our beautiful brains are, are running the show, um, in fact, they aren't. In fact, they are responding to what's happening to, in the body. So polyvagal theory through these three organizing principles, um, hierarchy, neuroception, and co-regulation gives us a roadmap to help our clients begin to understand um, what is happening in their nervous system and how it's impacting, how it's shaping the way that they navigate their daily living. So just to give you a very brief capsule of um, those three organizing principles. Um, hierarchy is, is the way we move in and out of regulation. And um, Steve's beautiful theory really um, describes, defines, shows us how we move from regulation first to fight and flight, that extra mobilizing energy. And if that doesn't solve the problem that we're trying to meet in that moment, we then fall into dorsal disappearing collapse, um, numbing shutdown, right? And that is the order in which this works. It's the evolutionary order in which the system was built. And it's the order in which we then dissolve. It's called evolution and dissolution. Evolution says dorsal came first, this, <clears throat> excuse me, hibernating, disappearing, going through the world in a slow way. And when we are um, prompted by a cue of danger, we, we disappear, we become immobile, we, we become invisible. You know, if you think about an ancient tortoise, um, you, you know the way they kind of go slowly through the world. And when they get scared, they go into their shell, right? And, and the lovely thing about that, that image um, is what do we do to help a tortoise come out of its shell, right? I had a, a learned this from a, from a client. We were playing around with it because she went to dorsal often and we decided, well, you don't pick up the turtle and shake it, right? Or you don't knock on the shell and say, come out, right? And that's what we have to remember as therapists when our clients go to that place of disappearing, becoming immobile, um, shut down, collapse, we don't want to go knock on the shell or shake them. That's not how we get a nervous system to come alive again, right? We, we help a client by being with, by bringing our regulated system to be near their system so that their system can feel that it's not alone in that place. Because the trauma experience is that we get dysregulated. We go to a survival response, but we go alone and we're stuck there. And so, you know, my clients would say for that dorsal place, um, I'm, I'm alone, lost, abandoned, where no one will ever find me. That's that experience of, of being shut down, collapsed. And so the antidote for that is to make sure that a client is not alone and lost, where they know we have found them, we are with them, and we are going to accompany them back out of that state into regulation. So then if we move up one step on the hierarchy, the way evolution created our nervous system, we go to fight and flight. And that's the more familiar um, survival response, right? And that's the survival response that, that was in place before Steve developed polyvagal theory. His, his gift to we therapists really is this um, mapping of dorsal because so many of our clients go to that place of shutdown, collapse, disconnection. And we had no way to understand it through our biology or through the, the um, client's response, except through um, stress. It was either we were regulated or stressed. So sympathetic, that fight flight, the next to emerge was built on top of dorsal. And then at the top of the hierarchy is ventral, which is this place of safety and regulation of connection, 
and the connection that comes when our nervous system takes us to ventral. I call it home when we come home to ventral because I do believe that our nervous system has an inherent longing to be there and knowing how to get there. In our work, we are all helping our clients um, become, um, lo lo let go of their suffering and in my language, become regulated, right? And in order to do that, you know, my belief is we're not adding anything to their system. We're just uncovering what's already there. We're helping them rediscover and reconnect to what is already there for them. So um, we come to that place of, of ventral and the four pathways of connection that are available to us from that place of regulation are connection to self, connection to others, connection to the world around us, and connection to spirit. And what the polyvagal theory tells us is that unless we are anchored in that place of ventral, when we leave that place and go to survival, either sympathetic or dorsal, we then are unable to connect to any of those four pathways. And not because we don't want to, but because our biology will not allow it. So when you're sitting across from a client and um, they are, um, you know, we used to say, you know, maybe they were not compliant or they didn't want it enough or they weren't trying hard enough, right? When we look through the lens of the nervous system, we say their biology is not supporting this at the moment, right? And so our job then becomes to bring cues of safety in so that their nervous system can meet us in that place and support them in engaging in therapy, right? That the goal is never to opt to be always in a ventral state. That is never the goal for anybody. The goal is to know when we're leaving and to have a pathway back back home, right? To have a pathway back to ventral so that we don't get stuck in survival. And that's the difference between a, a system that has a, a dysregulated, rigid response or a flexible response that brings resilience. Resilience, which is a big thing we're using now in, in therapy, resilience is an autonomic nervous system outcome. It's an outcome of a nervous system that can flexibly come back to ventral, right? That dysregulates and comes back, dysregulates and comes back. And that's what we're trying to bring for our clients, that capacity to, to keep coming back. So that's hierarchy. The second is neuroception, which I find to be a beautiful word. Steve developed that where he created that word because there was not a word that talked about how the nervous system takes in information. So how it does it is um, through um, an, an underlying process that does not involve the thinking parts of our brain. Because even though the nervous system has projections that connect to the cortex and connect to limbic, it basically is a brainstem structure. Right? And so how does it do what it does? Well, neuroception is the way that it's taking in cues from what I call inside, outside, and between. It's taking in cues from inside your body, from outside in the environment, and from between your nervous system and another nervous system. And it does that micro moment to micro moment. And when it takes those in, the outcome of that is that you are moved from state to state. So neuroception is really what starts this whole process of us being regulated or dysregulated. And we have to bring perception to neuroception in order to do anything with it, which is a great reminder that really working this way is making the implicit experiences that we know are going on with our clients and, and with us in the therapeutic relationship and making them explicit, bringing them into explicit awareness so that we can talk about them, we can use them, we can shape them. So neuroception, neuro for neural, inception for awareness is a, is a really lovely word that, that um, I hope you all will become familiar with. And then the third co-regulation is really, I mean, we, we clinicians have known forever that, that we, the therapeutic relationship really is the foundation of any sort of therapy. Whatever kind of therapy we're practicing doesn't matter. It's about the relationship, right? The um, polyvagal theory really shows us why that's true. And this is about co-regulation and what autonomic attunement, right? Not just, not just brain to brain but nervous system and the nervous system attunement is really what we're talking about. I like to, to call it autonomic intimacy, 
that we move into with our with our clients this this truly shared experience below the level of our of our language right it's happening two systems are in communication with a different language going on and you know co-regulation is what we call a biological imperative which means that it's something we can't survive without right and we know this from the studies of babies who come into the world and, and um, aren't met by a, a caring loving other right we know it from the studies of romanian orphanages and you know many of the uh, research that has gone on you know it because you have adult clients sitting with you whose nervous systems can't come into co-regulation where you feel dangerous to their nervous system because you're a human being right because their experience with others is that people are dangerous and that's where we start building our therapeutic relationship is is not only reassuring the client through language but reassuring their nervous system that i am a safe other that my commitment is to be regulated to stay regulated and to offer that regulating presence and that regulating energy to them. And that's often a missing experience for our clients. A friendship is not something you just do. You continue to nurture that friendship. And that's really what we need to do with our nervous systems. We don't just meet the nervous system, get introduced, and then all is good. It's it's just creating an ongoing connection and friendship and, and honoring what's happening so the the nervous system is um what i think of as the the foundation for all of your lived experience it's where everything begins in your um, mind body system we think that the brain is um running the show but in fact it's beneath the level of the brain it's inside your body it's in these pathways that help us connect that help us mobilize into fight and flight and that help us move into disconnection and disappearance. And all of those things are built into our human um, body for very good reason. So your nervous system, just like every nervous system, and I think that's the other thing I love is that the nervous system really is a, a common denominator in all human beings. We all have one. Yes. Well, in this diversity that is being presented and everything, and, and it's so important in this heart-mind situation that it's a lot of what this is about, and it's very important for us to hear people's hearts, you know, sing out and hear, and there's not enough of that in science and medicine and healthcare and institutions, et cetera, et cetera. That's very true, and that's very real, and it's really important. And then, you know, in a more kind of like team approach than some of my work, because then I'm, I'm down there, I'm in ceremony, I just got back from the Amazon and, you know, we're in ceremony with ayahuasca and so yeah, I just let it all hang out, out there. And then part of my job and my work here in the States is to help people walk from the mind to the heart, you know, from this academic understanding and how do we let these, how do we reach people, you know, yes, we can reach them directly heart to heart and then sometimes people need something to wrap their head around you know, to walk their way down into um, some of these spaces. And so how do we, when we want to talk about the way the energy comes into us and the energy that we experience and that's very real and that science maybe is, doesn't know what to do with and the way that touches our hearts and our emotional beings and how real that is. And then how does that connect, you know, to these understandings of, of mind and body, you know, that are floating around in academia? You know, where does the spirit touch the flesh and in a way that we could uh, understand and articulate or at least talk about. So that's what my, you know, interest is. And so that's what the talk, illuminating, so psychedelic medicine. So for me, it was like ayahuasca shamanism, but then also getting involved in this with the MDMA. That this psychedelic medicine is illuminating the interface between biology, emotion, and spirituality. And that's the bridge. You know, that emotion is the bridge into what we're feeling and what we're singing and calling out and receiving from the energy from the ancestors, etc. And there's a there's a biology that we already know about around emotion and fear and anger and attachment and all these kind of things. So that's it. This was I just throwing this out there because I'm here with Belinda, my friend, you know, from Arizona and um 
she's coming as, you know, a Diné woman, Zuni woman, and then I'm coming to kind of bring the message from the Amazon, from you know, my family's from Colombia, South America, and my teachers and ayahuasca are she peoples from the Amazon. And so for us, and this is what Jamila also touched on, is the, the spiritual context, you know, that to be able to, and, and you know, MAPS has been done a great job of trying to articulate things in a secular enough way to not ruffle enough feathers that it starts to enter the lexicon, you know, that we can start talking about whether it's the mindfulness or the inner, I don't know, it was the inner healer or the beginner's mind, you know, and start finding words and then allow the people from these other cultures, from our cultures, to come unabashedly and say, this is spiritual, you know, this is spiritual. And so, you know, when we did the Arizona Psychedelics Conference a little while ago, you know, one of the points Belinda was making was, how come spirit is always supposed to catch up to the science? You know, like that's exactly what's wrong. That's exactly why our society is suffering and is misguided, is that, that the most holistic element is left last. And one of our friends there, Daryl Slim, is, a, is an Navajo uh, medicine man, Diné medicine man. So he says that, like, as we try to figure things out, when we have this mind, body, emotion, energy, spirit, mysticism, etc., that really spirit is first, that we should be putting spirit first. Because spirit or the mystery or however we want to talk about it, we don't need to get so hung up on the words because we're trying to communicate, we're trying to share our experience. So what I'm calling spirit, this moment, that we experience, okay, the totality of our living experience this moment, that's the spirit. We, 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 we feel that. So the, our feeling, which through our body, is how we come to know, you know, that we are alive, and that's how we come to know the experience of spirit. And so then our mind is simply a reflection on that experience. And our body is, you know, we're feeling more reacting. Our mind is simply a reflection. The most important thing is how we feel, because that's the reality of how we're responding to this moment of, of, of being alive. So healing people's feeling is so important to help them uh, experience unity. It made me understand that what allowed that, that connection to be achieved was the diminishment of my ego defenses. And that I was like, oh, that's what spirituality is. It's lack of ego. Um, because ego is what builds the walls between us and nature and us and other people, us and the universe. And so the real opposite word for spiritual is egotistical, not material. And that to the extent you can begin to transcend your ego, that can open you up to spiritual experience. Now, that may not be everybody's experience, but it was my experience. And it was a, that was a really precious insight uh, that I credit to these, uh, to these amazing molecules. I think it's true that psychedelics have potential to address some deep problems of our civilization, which I, and I see them as two main ones. One is our disconnection from nature, which is giving us the environmental crisis that we face, perhaps the most serious problem that we've ever faced as a civilization. And the second is the, uh, the, the tribalism that, that is so um, ascendant right now. Both of those problems are, are, are connected. They both flow from the objectification of the other, an inability to see that you're part of it, you're the same. Um, that allows you to, to detest people, to mistreat them, to, to build walls against them. Same with the objectification of nature. It allows you to abuse it, to extract. It allows you to put pigs in confinement agriculture. I mean, all those things flow from objectification. Um, the loss of ego and the reduction of our defenses creates a, a, a very different experience of the other. The other is you. Um, there's no difference. Now, that sounds like an antidote for a civilization, but I don't think it's possible to prescribe a medicine for an entire civilization. Um, how many people would need to have this experience for that to change? I don't know. Maybe it just certain people need to have the experience for it to change, people with power? I don't know. 
But I think it's, I think it's a dream. It's a lovely dream, but I think it's a dream that you can use a medicine to change consciousness on a civilization wide level that will change things. Perhaps you change the consciousness of people who can tell stories so compellingly, make movies so beautifully, write symphonies so beautifully that that contributes to a consciousness change. But we don't have a model for prescribing to a civilization except for like fluoride. And I think that's very different than LSD and the water supply. And so when you heal people this way, at this deep soul level, very commonly, they wake up spiritually. They start, you know, having experiences of, of the connectedness of all things and understanding their place in this world and this life. They're no longer ashamed of being alive, or being born. And they start connecting to nature, for example. So that's really important spirit first. This is my background. I'm a medical doctor, family medicine. I did some research. The sun sets early in Siberia. At dusk, Bayer Rinchinov, one of the most celebrated and experienced shamans east of Lake Baikal, begins his shamanic rituals. Today's ritual is designed to invoke the spirit's healing abilities and thank them for their powers. Work at the Russian Academy of Sciences is drawing to a close. Valentina Haritonova, head of the unit for the study of shamanism, is inspecting the new exhibits displayed at the Institute's Ethnographic Museum. They have been supplied by scientists returning from this year's field expeditions. Valentina has spent years studying humans' extrasensory and extrasensitive potential. Shamanic rituals differ depending on the ethnicity of the shamans. Each ethnic group has its own interpretation of the spirits. In this particular case, the spirit penetrates a shaman's body in a somewhat unusual way. To all appearances, the shaman's mind undergoes a change which is the result of deep immersion. Monday scientists have not given up their quest to understand what happens to shamans when they are in contact with the spirits. They want to know whether shamanism is not some sort of myth created by a group of mentally imbalanced people. Research was done several years ago at both the Institute of Neurophysiology and Higher Nervous Activity and the Institute for Ethnology and Anthropology at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Initially, so-called neo-shamans and urban shamans were involved in those special experiments. Neo-shamans represented a new generation of shamanic tradition. Here is a demonstration of an experiment in the presence of a large audience. These experts studying shamanism represent a number of countries. For a start, instruments are attached to the body of a neo-shaman. They will record the state of his blood vessels. This somewhat odd device on his head is a special cap designed by one of our offices. A shaman's creative act is an act of affectation. That is to say, he needs to work himself up into a state of ecstasy. After that, all processes inside his brain slow down, especially those connected with speech. Then the brain begins functioning in a fashion which is not characteristic of its normal activity. In other words, the man activates the brain's right hemisphere, particularly its frontal lobes, which are responsible for his creative thinking. You that it's a visualization process? Yes. Uh, in fact, he kept a journal of how he learned to do it a few years before, uh, when he was challenged by another science fiction writer, Harry Stein, to do this. And he spent three weeks um, doing what we would normally think of doing, which is, you know, yelling at the thing, uh, pushing with our minds, concentrating. Oh, probably yeah, I, I've been going about it all the wrong way, sitting there going... Ah, you know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's exactly the opposite. It's, it's Think of it as a blank stare. Um, you become a Vulcan, you become Mr. Spock, and it basically oh. turns hmm. because of your intention, not because of any strong, strong emotion you've got. Wow. You'd see these people get blank stares. Their, their faces would go blank. They go into a light altered state. And so, sure. But they're, look at watching people do this. It's really interesting because their faces go blank. And it's almost as if they're watching.
watching them, their hands do things on their own. There's an altered state involved, and that light altered state, it's kind of like being in the zone, what athletes talk about as being in the zone. Oh, I know all about being in the zone. It's not just athletes that get in a zone. Right, that's correct. Uh, anybody, even, even people, uh, the job I do here, I know... Lloyd, when I'm in the zone, you can, it's a feeling that is hard to describe, mm -hmm. but it's, it's like you can do no wrong. Right. And everything you do is going to go boom, 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 just exactly the way it's supposed to go. That's the zone, whether it's athletics or um, it, it's artistic. Well, yes, whatever it is, it's a definite place, this zone. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's non judgmental. My question relates to sort of when uh, that segment of the show when we were talking about the zone and, and how to use uh, psychokinesis. Um, I'm a bit of a history student myself, uh, specifically in Asian history, and uh, a previous caller had mentioned um, Buddhism. Mm -hmm. I wanted to touch on uh, Shaolin and uh, the amazing physical abilities that these Shaolin Buddhist monks have been able to achieve Mm -hmm. uh, in their temples and the like, uh, in terms of being able to uh, met, uh, change their body temperatures, uh, meditate for days on end without food and such. I would figure these guys would be the masters of being able to do this sort of psychokinesis, to have this uh, nirvana, this zone, this mm -hmm. uh, in the head. Uh, and yet, uh, through all the studies that I've done amateurly uh, and as a history student, and uh, among other fellow historians, there's just no um, correlation between their uh, prowess of the mind and dominating the body and them being able to do psychokinesis. So, so what do you have to say about that? Well, you know, in China, um, I've, I've been working with a Chinese researcher, and they often talk about um, using qi actually outside mm -hmm. the body. And this is not necessarily the Shaolin, but it's other people who... And I've met other martial artists who supposedly could throw sh throw chi energy and affect things at a distance. And in fact, when I in my very first job at, uh, in parapsychology was working at the American Society for Psychical Research, and uh, we had a martial artist come in from uh, from Ohio who was trained by a Shaolin um, a monk actually years before, and he was able to uh, affect actually to break a photoelectric beam from the other side of the room by just simply making a motion and throw and he said throwing chi and also do some other physical things as well outside his body and this was on top of all the physical things he could do he ended up actually being one of the people who taught the men who stare at ghosts as it turned out <laughs> and he also taught some delta force guys and um some other are the army rangers and other folks to do some pretty amazing things which i've seen on video uh, i have to say that Martial artists, many martial artists, have really interesting things going on. Uh, my dad was a producer for NBC Sports, and when I was much younger, I got to see a film of uh, someone breaking uh, a brick, some brick surface, actually it was multi layers with their hand, which is you know something that martial artists can do. But it was shot at a thousand frames per second. And I've seen it re talked about in other places as well. And the film did exist at NBC, at least during the 70s, early 70s. And you see the stone breaking before the hand actually hits it. Um, mm -hmm. There are drugs, uh, Lloyd, that are well documented um, in producing, what's the right word? Um you know, I, I hesitate to even say hallucinations, but they allow self-examination in, in a strange way. You know, the DMTs, the right. um, those types of things. And I wonder if, as part of your examination of the paranormal, if you have looked into any of this. Um, you know, the, the drug thing, certainly folks in my field have done that. Certainly we're doing that uh, when it was okay to do so. Um, Andrew Poharic who wrote the book The Sacred Mushroom back uh, so long ago was doing research in telepathy using the psilocybin mushroom right. in very small amounts. Uh, some of the researchers were using LSD uh, before it was illegal, uh, and I know there have been some other experiments done, perhaps, perhaps maybe on the side with marijuana and some other things. Uh, it, it, parapsychology is incredibly underfunded. <laughs> so uh, trying to do 
a drug trial or something with drugs today requires incredible oversight at any university or any laboratory these days. Sure. And there's just no money to do it. Um, so we have to go on the second-hand or even first-hand observations, anecdotal stories that people tell us when they have these experiences. And it seems that it's not just drugs, food, foodstuffs. You know, food is a drug. Sure. And you can play with food and have uh, people's states of consciousness affected. And we do know that changing a person's state of consciousness can make them more or less psychic, depending on, on the person and the state of consciousness they go into. Um, the biggest problem with hallucinogens is being able to separate the psychic imagery from the hallucinatory imagery. Yes, I, I, I guess the big question is whether there even is truly a separation. And it may yeah, be, there, may not be. It, there yeah. may not be. It may be that it actually does open doors. I don't want to encourage well, any, anybody to experiment with drugs, but it may be. One of the one of the effects that's reported with hallucinogens is uh, synesthesia. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, people will suddenly see musical no the music in color that's right. as it's playing. That's right. It's a switching. It's a switching of sensory input and perception. That's what synesthesia is. And there is now some study going on. Uh, my colleague Ed May, actually, with his uh, his colleague in India, Sonali Marwaha, and Christine Simmons Moore at the University of West Georgia, are all doing research on synesthesia and that people with some degree of synesthesia may actually be psychic. Donna Williams writes, All of us begun in the sensory. From here we progressively move towards deeper levels of progressing. As we become better able to filter out information not specific to us, we become able to focus and choose. Instead of being drawn indiscriminately and without choice into purely sensory experiences with an absence of mind. Thought continues, but it continues beyond the accessible grasp of the conscious mind, within the triggerable realm of unknown knowing, the pre-conscious mind. The question is, can those who outgrew this ever return to this state once they have achieved an ongoing, consistent and permanent grip on consciousness. Perhaps those who have a tentative hold on it may be more likely to hold on to the system beyond infancy, even into adulthood, in spite of social structures which promote its progressive but speedy redundancy. Those who live in these other realms, with or without visitors' visas to the perceptual world most people share, are generally the people who have retained or mastered the system of 